now we come to what is called the Proterozoic Eon. The name of this is important. Proto means like early or before. Zo means life. And if you notice, this is the longest of the eons, lasting over two billion years. Some people call this the boring billions, but I don't think so. So what happened during this two billion years of Earth's history? Well, we don't know a lot of what was going on because like I said, the Earth's surface is very dynamic. It's constantly moving. It's erasing evidence of its past. It's kind of recycling it. But we do know that there were continents. The continents were moving around. There are people that have actually been able to piece together what we think the continents looked like in the late Proterozoic about 650 million years ago. And we think that there may have been even supercontinents back then. That's when all the land masses come together to form one giant continent. And we know that during the Proterozoic Eon, the continents reached about their current size. Now, I'm not saying they looked anything like today, but the land mass, the size of them became about what they are today. Now, remember back in the Archean, we had this little evolutionary innovation called photosynthesis. Well, photosynthesis is kicking out oxygen. You cyanobacteria day in and day out for billions of years, for, for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, we're releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. Now, in previous videos, people have pointed out that the rise in oxygen was not steady. And they're right. First of all, our oceans were full of iron. So oxygen reacted with iron and formed iron deposits. And then finally, there were some big jumps in oxygen levels. And guess what? Life had to respond to that. So the, the response to the rise in free oxygen, because free oxygen, you know, O2, is damaging to life. The response to it, you can see on the thing I circled eukaryotes, the origins of cellular respiration, or I should say aerobic respiration, because this is the ability to use oxygen, right, to break down organic material and get a lot more energy out of it. So I said earlier, oxygen energized life because life could now be much more efficient at extracting energy from this environment. Wow. And of course, as oxygen energized these bacteria, they had a lot more energy available to them now. Guess what happened next? Endosymbiosis. Now, endo means within, symbio means living together. And an endosymbiosis, for you and I, is clearly another one of the most important key evolutionary innovations. So, DNA replication, photosynthesis, aerobic respiration, and now endosymbiosis. And this led to the origins of eukaryotic cells. Remember, eukaryotes are those larger, more complex cells. We define them physically by having a cell nucleus, but from an evolutionary point of view, it's by having the mitochondria, because the mitochondria were once those free living, aerobically respiring bacteria. And once they merge together, this bacteria and an archaean, the cells had they could grow larger and more complex because you could pack them full of mitochondria to provide additional energy as the cell got larger and larger and larger. Isn't that cool? So we had the biggest restructuring of cells in over 2 billion years of Earth's history or of history of life on the Earth. And... This is important. Why did I say it was important for you and me? Because all multicellular life, plants and animals and fungus are made up of eukaryotic cells. Even to this day, prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaean, those two domains of life, they remain small and structurally simple. The reason why is they get larger and larger and larger. They make ATP across their cell membrane, but their volume gets lar larger more quickly than the surface. So they quickly run out of energy. So think about it this way. We got these key events, right? Photosynthesis caused the evolution of aerobic respiration. And then aerobic respiration made it possible for endosymbiosis and the origin of eukaryotes. And the eukaryotes, of course, evolved into multicellular life. We have lots of evidence for this. 
uh, prokaryotes reproduce by binary fission inside of your cells. They have circular DNA like a bacteria. They even have some of their own ribosomes. And this endosymbiotic theory was proposed by Lynn Margulis in the 1960s. And nobody believed her. She was kind of laughed off the stage, to, so to speak. Shouldn't have done that. She was very smart and she was right. And by the 1980s, when they had the technology to realize DNA is inside of mitochondria, then we knew she was right. Now, one of my pet peeves is that endosymbiosis is almost always shown incorrectly. And uh, it always, there, there's this idea of one bacterium engulfing another, like this illustration I have. This is wrong. It looks right, but it's wrong. And I've talked about this in other videos, but basically um, bacteria have, do not have the ability to do phagocytosis. They don't have a complex cytoskeleton or uh, equivalent that can actually engulf another cell. We don't see them do this. And uh, the other one that's also wrong is this one where it shows like a bacteria cell getting larger and larger and larger, forming a proto eukaryotic cell that then engulfs the aerobically respiring bacteria that evolves into the mitochondria. Of course, this is a beautiful illustration. This is wrong. And the reason why is you can't have a proto eukaryotic cell growing larger and larger and larger because it would run out of energy. Okay, so energy production is what limits the cell size of prokaryotes. It's not the fusion. The books are all wrong. So there were other changes that took place during the Proterozoic. Well, this oxygen revolution, some people refer, it, refer to it as a great oxygen catastrophe. I wouldn't say that. I disagree. I'm not so sure that it caused massive death versus life just kind of evolved to adapt to the higher levels of oxygen. But there were several changes that the oxygen had to the Earth. This is a picture of Titan and the Earth side by side. Now, Titan is not as large as the Earth, but it does have a very hazy atmosphere because it's full of methane and other organic molecules, much like the Earth was before oxygen. But oxygen reacts with methane. It reacts with organic molecules. It oxidizes them, right? Forms carbon dioxide. And so what happens, it forms carbon dioxide and water, right? When it reacts with organic molecules. So oxygen basically cleared out our atmosphere and cleared out the oceans of all the iron. So now we have these beautiful blue skies that's due to Rayleigh scattering of the nitrogen in the atmosphere and beautiful blue water because we removed all the iron from it. So if I were to go back to the end of the Proterozoic, it would look like this, sort of. This is from Baja, California. Ah, I need to get back down there. There were other changes that happened during the Proterozoic as well. One of them is we have very good evidence that the Earth was locked in an ice age that lasted almost 100 million years. Wow. And we call this the Cryogenian. And we have evidence that there were glaciers almost all the way down to the equator. And this was, of course, caused by a positive feedback loop, probably because all the continents moved right near the equator. There was no life on the continents, or at least no plant life. So the rock weathering was fast. And the, rock, and the rock weathering scrubbed the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and the earth cooled. As you got more ice, reflected more energy back into space. And we kind of got this positive feedback on a runaway ice age. So there it is. That was a snowball earth. Um, always reminds me of Ice Planet Hoth. Another Star Wars reference, right? Where you might find a hidden rebel base. Now, the Proterozoic is also interesting because we get the beginnings of multicellular life occur here. Both plants, animals, and the third one, fungus. So here's another evolutionary innovation. The primary endosymbiosis occurred when you formed eukaryotes. Then a line of eukaryotes went on and engulfed, that's, that's correct, eukaryotes can do phagocytosis, they engulfed some cyanobacteria, and that went on to form chloroplast. And we start to see the beginnings of the evolution of plants. Now, we didn't think that there were multicellular 
ancestors to plants until about 700 million years ago, that has changed. We now believe that the oldest green algae might date back to 1 billion years ago. And this is uh, pretty cool. So we know that this photosynthesis from cyanobacteria was important because it was adding nutrients and energy to our ecosystems so you could have more life. And it was also adding oxygen to the atmosphere, which energized life. But with multicellular green algae, like in this picture, now we're adding more nutrients, more energy, and now we're adding complexity to our ecosystems. So rather than having bacterial mats, now we're getting actual structures out there in the water, right? And we're providing additional habitats for things to live, like the earliest multicellular life that may have been animals. And, um, you know, what were the ancestors to animals? Well, it turns out they were protists. These eukaryotes, they had this collar cell around them, and we call them coanoflagellates. And these coanoflagellates can actually be found in sponges, which most people consider to be an animal. I do not. I think they're outside of animals. Another lecture for that, of course. But the evolution of animals began probably going back almost a billion years. And in the Proterozoic, there was multicellular life. This is the Ediacaran life forms. And they get the name Ediacaran from the Ediacara Hills of Australia, where they were found. For a long time, it was thought that there was no multicellular life before the Cambrian explosion, which occurred about 542 million years ago. But somebody found these fossils, and we don't really know if they were plants, animals, another lineage of multicellular life that failed. This, of course, is Dixonium. Don't know what it was. Here's an artistic illustration of what a late Proterozoic shallow ocean may have looked like with these life forms. And like I said, we, we, we just don't know. But the end of the Proterozoic ended in a bang not from a meteor impact or a volcanic explosion, but from the rapid diversification of life. So that's pretty cool. So if you think about the Proterozoic, it's not a boring 2 billion. The continents reached their current size. You had the oxygenic revolution that altered life. You got the evolution of aerobic respiration, endosymbiosis, and the origins of multicellular life. And then of course, next, you know, here comes... Here comes life coming on with a roar. But to put this into perspective, the Earth now is 4.1 billion years old at this stage. All right. So next, we're going to start doing the Phanerozoic. 